In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Before I begin, I'd like to explain what I'm not going to present tonight. I am not going to present a scientific refutation of the evolutionary hypothesis. Our standard uh, seminar is five hours long, and when we give that seminar, I bring one of our scientists with me, and we're able to cover all of the major topics, theological and natural science topics. It's impossible to do that in the time allotted to me tonight. So what I'm going to do is to set forth the traditional authoritative teaching of the Catholic Church on creation, what was believed and proclaimed by all the fathers, doctors, popes and councils in their authoritative teaching. Then I'll show how a challenge was mounted against this beautiful doctrine by natural scientists outside of the household of the faith. And then I will show how this, the acceptance of this evolutionary challenge outside and inside the Catholic community has done immense harm to the world and to the Catholic community. And finally, why it's so urgent that we all defend and restore the traditional Catholic doctrine of creation, which is the foundation of our holy faith. First, very briefly, something about me personally. This is a picture that was taken of me with my father a few years ago. And my father was the son of a Welsh Baptist minister. He was brought up in a devout Christian home. But when he went to university in England, he was taught evolution, secular humanism. Science can explain everything without God. And he left university completely robbed of his faith. And that's what put him on the trajectory that led to his becoming the first ever Secretary General of International Planned Parenthood Federation. He held that position for less than a year when he died unexpectedly of a heart attack when I was 16 years old. And his death precipitated my conversion to the Catholic faith. Today in the world, and even within Catholic academia, there are two different explanations for the origins of man and the universe. First, there is the creation model, which is the traditional teaching of the church, which holds that it was a fiat creation, and that God created everything by fiat for us in view of the incarnation and the immaculate conception. And when he had finished creating all of the different kinds of creatures for us, and he created Adam and Eve, he stopped the work of creation because it was complete. This is what St. Thomas calls the first perfection of the universe. And only then began the natural order of providence, which is what we are living in now. Competing with that, is what has become the consensus view in academia, even sadly in Catholic academia, which is an evolutionary model, and it has two forms. There's a purely naturalistic evolutionary model, which holds that from the very beginning of creation, everything has developed through natural processes, and therefore there is no distinction between the work of creation and the order of providence. There is also a different version of theistic evolution. Um, well, this is the version that's called usually theistic evolution, which holds that most of the development from the beginning was naturalistic, but God may have jumped in and worked a few miracles along the way to, to make all the transformations occur that needed to occur. But this model as well removes the distinction which was made by all the fathers and doctors between creation and providence. When our Lord Jesus Christ gave the great commandment, 
he told the apostles and disciples to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them all that he had commanded them. And that the foundation of that all was a very clear doctrine with regard to the origins of man and the universe. If you go through the four Gospels and you highlight every single place where our Lord speaks about anything in the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, which bring us from creation to the Tower of Babel, you will find that every time he cites anything in Genesis 1 to 11, he refers to it as history. I won't have time to go through all the verses, but just for example, in Mark 10, verse 6, our Lord speaks about Adam and Eve as real historical people who were created in the beginning of creation, not 15 billion years after an alleged Big Bang. When he speaks about Abel, the son of Adam and Eve, he locates him at the foundation of the world, which in Holy Scripture and in the Fathers refers to the beginning of creation, not just to the beginning of human history. And when our Lord speaks about the Noachic Flood, He speaks of it as a global event which affected every creature on earth when it occurred. And this is why He compares His second coming to the Noachic Flood, because the second coming is an event that will affect every creature on earth when it occurs. And the only event in history that He can compare it to is the Flood in the time of Noah. But most importantly of all, Whenever our Lord worked one of His miracles, He acted in the same way that He had acted when with the Father and the Holy Ghost, He spoke the heavens and the earth and the seas and all they contain into existence. There was no believing Jew in the time of Jesus who did not believe that what the psalmist said was literally true. He spoke and it was made. He commanded and it stood forth. So when our Lord went to the tomb of Lazarus, three days a decaying corpse, and He said, come out, in a split second, out came a fully functioning, breathing human being. And this is how the people knew that He was God in the flesh, because He acted in the same way that God had acted in the beginning, when He spoke the heavens and the earth and the seas, and all they contain into existence. Now Jesus Christ also told us that if we believe Moses, we will believe him. But if we do not believe in Moses and what he wrote, we're not going to believe his words. We, however, have largely traded our birthright of truth for a mess of Darwinian pottage. The Church tells us in her authoritative teaching that we are to believe the literal and obvious sense of Scripture unless reason dictates or necessity requires. That's the teaching of Providentissimus Deus or Leo XIII summarizing the Catholic way to interpret the Holy Scriptures and that of course is referenced in Dei Verbum as still the official teaching of the Church. So throughout the Bible, we read that Moses wrote. Moses wrote all the words of Jehovah. Jehovah said unto Moses, Write thou these words. Moses wrote their goings out. Moses wrote this law. And Leo the Thirteenth in Providentissimus Deus says that we have to accept the plain sense of those words. Because the literal sense, the sense intended by the sacred author is the foundation, as the Catechism reminds us, of all the other senses of sacred scripture. Today, when we speak this way, we're often attacked. We said, you sound like a Protestant fundamentalist. But in reality, we Catholics take God at his word far more than any other group of Christians. We always have and we always will. I don't have time to demonstrate that every sacrament and every fundamental doctrine of the Catholic faith is actually based on taking God at His word. But let's just take a couple of examples. Why do we confess our sins to a priest? Because in John's Gospel, chapter 20, 
our Lord said, Receive the Holy Ghost. Whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whose sins you hold bound, they are held bound. And it's impossible to obey that commandment without hearing the sins of penitence in holy confession. Do Protestant fundamentalists take God at his word in John 20? No, they do not. And why do we believe that the Holy Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ under the appearance of bread and wine? Because at the mystical supper our Lord took bread and said, This is my body which will be given up for you. So we take God at his word. Do the Protestant fundamentalists take God at his word? No, they do not. And so the whole idea that Catholics are somehow above taking God at his word and only stupid fundamentalists take him at his word is absurd because we take God at his word far more than any other group of Christians. We always have and we always will. And Pope Leo XIII prophetically warned if the young lose their reverence for the Holy Scripture on one or more points and he had Genesis in mind when he said this, they are easily led to give up believing in it altogether. And this is why there are so few Catholic young people who when they pick up their Bible feel that sense of awe and reverence that they are holding the inerrant God-breathed Word of God. The fathers taught that Moses was the prophet of the past he spoke to God face to face and God showed him the work of creation. St. John Chrysostom, St. Basil the Great, the man Moses who was made equal to the angels, being considered worthy of the sight of God face to face, reports to us those things which he heard from God. St. Ambrose, plainly and clearly, Moses opened his mouth and uttered what the Lord spoke within him. So as other prophets were shown the future, and predicted it infallibly, Moses was also shown the past, the work of creation, and described it with infallible truth. But that's not the consensus view in Catholic academia today, and it hasn't been for a long time. In the beginning of the 19th century, Julius Wellhausen and other scholars like him looked at the findings of the new science of archaeology and they reasoned very logically that archaeologists had not found any evidence that there was writing in the time of Moses. So they, they reasoned if there was no writing in the time of Moses, <laughs> therefore Moses couldn't have written anything and therefore the Bible wasn't accurate when it said that Moses wrote or redacted the first five books of the Bible. Wellhausen had other reasons for believing that Moses wasn't the author redactor of the first five books of the Bible. He argued that there were no kings in, in Israel in the time of Moses and yet Moses speaks of kings. There were no domesticated camels in the time of Moses and yet Moses speaks of camels being domesticated in the time of Abraham. The Philistines weren't a great military power in the time of Moses, and yet he speaks of the Philistines. So wouldn't any reasonable scholar join the Wellhausen school and abandon the constant teaching of all the fathers and doctors of the church? Not if he had any true piety. You see, this is a paradigm for what has happened in so many different areas of knowledge where a little bit of evidence seems to contradict the traditional teaching of the church. And so many scholars, instead of humbly waiting until more evidence comes in which always ends up confirming the traditional teaching, they hop on the latest bandwagon of the latest academic fashion and abandon the traditional teaching of the church. Since the Wellhausen period, archaeologists have uncovered huge amounts of evidence that there was writing 1,000 years before the time of Moses. We've found evidence that camels were domesticated in the time of Abraham. 
No, there were no kings in Israel in the time of Moses, but wasn't he a prophet? <laughs> Couldn't God have shown him that there would be kings in the future, even if there weren't kings in his lifetime? And if the Philistines were not a great military power as they were later on, does that mean that they didn't exist? The United States was not a great military power 200 years ago. Does that mean we didn't exist? And scholars have noticed other things. What is the first prophecy of the Messiah? Genesis 3.15 God says to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. But is it he will crush your head, she will crush your head, or it will crush your head? Because the pronoun that is used in the Hebrew is called an epicene personal pronoun. It doesn't have a gender. The gender has to be determined from the context which is just one of a hundred thousand reasons why sola scriptura can't possibly be right because it's only in the light of tradition that we can correctly interpret Genesis 3.15 and so we know thanks to holy tradition that Saint Jerome was inspired when he translated it ipsa contaret she will crush your head but the interesting thing is the epicene personal pronoun is only found in the first five books of the Bible. And something else, as scholars have delved more deeply into the Hebrew text, they have noticed that the first five books of the Bible and only the first five books of the Bible are full of Egyptian loan words words which were brought into the Hebrew language from the Egyptian language. Now why would only the first five books of the Bible be full of Egyptian loan words? Could it be because Moses was educated in the court of Pharaoh? Could it be that all the fathers, doctors, popes and council fathers were actually not nincompoops? If you believe Moses, our Lord Jesus Christ said, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? Two ecumenical councils have taught that when all the fathers of the church agree on any interpretation of scripture that pertains to faith or morals, that is authoritative. And this is the teaching of all the fathers of the church, East and West, on creation. That God, solely by his good will, not through any kind of natural process, suddenly, not over great eons of time, brought everything, not just a few things, from non-being into being. And everything stood before him in perfection. Not on its way to some omega point of perfection in the future, but perfect in the beginning when it came forth from his hands. All the fathers and doctors taught that all the different kinds of creatures, not every breed of dog, but all the different kinds of creatures were created by fiat instantly and immediately for us in our first parents. That Adam was a special creation, body and soul. Eve was literally created from Adam's side. And when God had finished creating Adam and Eve, he placed them as the king and queen of the entire universe. And the work of creation was finished. And no new kind of creature has been created from that time. And all the fathers and doctors taught that this world when it came forth from God's hands was perfectly beautiful, immaculate, and perfectly reflected the goodness and the wisdom and the beauty of Almighty God. And that human death 
and deformity, disease, genetic mutations that are harmful, birth defects, all these things only came into this world because of the original sin of Adam. Which is why St. Augustine writes and speaks for all the fathers of the church in the city of God when he writes, in this creation had no one sinned, the world would have been filled and beautified with nature's good without exception. And this is why St. Paul in the letter to the Romans writes that the entire creation, the entire universe out to the most distant galaxies has been groaning in travail since the original sin and has been made subject to a mysterious bondage to decay. Not just the earth, but the entire universe. Now I would like to call another witness to the authoritative teaching of the Catholic Church on creation. I have already asked our Lord to testify, the fathers to testify, and now I'd like to call as my next witness the sacred icons approved by the bishops of the church to teach the faith to illiterate people. It's hard for us to remember that until 500 years ago almost nobody could read. And the faithful learned the faith in two ways, from preaching, by hearing, but also through the holy icons, and then in the West through the stained glass windows. So the Seventh Ecumenical Council defined that the holy icons approved for use in the churches by the bishops teach with the same authority as the Word of God that is proclaimed from the pulpits. And the holy icons of creation all look like this. You will see Jesus Christ, the Word through whom all things were made, speaking into existence all the different kinds of creatures. Iconographic sacred art was in the entire Catholic Church in the first millennium. It was only in the Renaissance that church in the West became naturalistic sacred art. But in the East, in all the Eastern Byzantine Catholic churches and in the Orthodox churches, the iconographic sacred art has been retained and the form is the same today in the third millennium as it was in the first millennium because the truth does not change. Pope Benedict XVI wrote very beautifully about the importance of the holy icons and he pointed out that in the first century in Palestine there were many synagogues that were decorated with representations of great events in salvation history and the Jews believed that these representations made present the reality of those events which had really taken place. And the Holy Father says that that is what gave rise to the iconographic tradition in the Catholic Church. So if we were in a first century synagogue and over here we had a mosaic of the sacrifice of Isaac, we would believe that that made present to us the reality of that event which actually took place. And so when we look at a holy icon of the Annunciation, if we understand it rightly, we believe that it's making present to us the reality of that mystery. We enter into the reality of that mystery, not as something that happened in the past, but as something that in some mysterious way exists in eternity. And it's interesting that authentic icons of the Holy Annunciation will show our Blessed Mother standing or sitting, but they will not show her in this posture. This is something that we begin to see in the Renaissance, but in an authentic icon, I only know of one exception, otherwise you will never see any posture but standing or sitting, and that is to safeguard theological truth, that the Queen of the Angels does not kneel before an angel. I'm not saying you couldn't make a case for Our Lady kneeling before Almighty God, but the icon safeguards theological truth and protects against the Protestant idea which became so rampant during and after the Renaissance 
But the Blessed Virgin was just a sinful woman like any other. The Catechism reminds us that the holy icons accord with the teaching of the Gospel. Here we have the creation of Adam from Monreale Cathedral, made a metropolitan cathedral by the Pope in the 12th century in Sicily, in the West. And I defy anybody to look at this holy icon and explain how it can be reconciled with Adam being conceived in the, in the womb of an evolved subhuman primate. Here we have the fifth day of creation, the eternal word speaking into existence, the creatures of the air and the creatures of the sea. We don't see land mammals going out to sea and becoming whales. We see God by fiat creating all the different kinds of creatures. And this is the most important icon of all, the icon of the seventh day. Here we see that creation is complete. It is beautiful. It is perfectly good. And God is able to rest in it. Now today, just as people scoff at the literal meaning of Holy Scripture, many would scoff at the idea that these holy icons would be a sure guide to doctrinal truth. They say, well, Moses was too unsophisticated to understand all the complexities of modern science. People back then, they weren't smart enough to understand all the intricacies of evolutionary theory. And so God had to give them this beautiful fairy tale, these nice pictures which don't correspond to the, all the complexities of what actually happened. But it's easy to refute this arrogant claim with one slide. This is the icon of human evolution. This minus the McDonald's man who is the most scientific part of this icon because unfortunately he corresponds to reality. This is what we find in biology textbooks in Catholic schools and universities all over the world. And please note, you do not need to understand anything about biology to understand what this icon is saying. You don't need to know that 2 plus 2 equals 4. And you can understand perfectly well what this icon is saying. So the whole notion that Moses was too stupid, too simple to understand evolution is preposterous. Because if this is what God did, he could have shown this to Moses or any of the ancients. And then on the walls of our cathedrals we would have beautiful mosaics of reptiles sprouting wings and becoming birds of land mammals going out to sea and becoming whales and a common ancestor of chimps and humans becoming Adam. No, the reason that we don't see these images in our cathedrals is because this is a fantasy concocted by proud men who could not accept that there are some things that we can't figure out by extrapolating with our little brains from the very limited realm of experience open to us all the way back to the very beginning of creation. My next witness is the testimony of the sacred liturgy. We have the principle in the Catholic Church, lex orandi, lex credendi. The law of praying is the law of believing. And as the Catechism reminds us, in the liturgy, the Holy Spirit is the teacher of faith to the people of God. We know that the authentic liturgical rites of the church were not produced by committees. It was the Holy Ghost in the church that prayed and prays the authentic liturgies of the church. And therefore, it has always been a principle in the church that what is taught by the sacred liturgy is truth because God is the one who prays in the sacred liturgy. So what does the sacred liturgy teach? The same thing that the sacred icons teach, the same thing that the fathers taught, the same thing that our Lord taught. This is from the Byzantine prayers for the dead. O most immaculate mother of God, he who from the beginning formed Eve, our first mother, from the rib of Adam, took flesh in your very womb. 
And notice how beautifully the words of the prayer agree with the holy icon, which agrees with the fathers, which agree with the plain sense of Genesis. All different facets of one beautiful diamond. Again from the Byzantine prayers for the dead. O oh, Savior, after you had made all things in perfection, you fashioned me a man. And so St. Thomas, when he summarizes the whole patristic tradition, East and West, articulates this same beautiful doctrine. And he writes in the Summa of the first perfection of the universe, which he defines as the completeness of the universe at its first founding. That means all the different kinds of creatures, each one perfect according to its nature, all together with man and for man in perfect harmony at the beginning of creation. And he says this is what is ascribed to the seventh day. Now St. Thomas also makes a fundamental distinction and we believe that the neglect of this distinction is the cause of most of the chaos and confusion in creation theology today. This principle that St. Thomas articulates in the Summa was held by every father and doctor of the church. And today it has been almost completely forgotten. St. Thomas writes, in the works of nature, creation does not enter, but is presupposed to the work of nature. What does this mean? In plain English it means that the work of creation was the work of God alone. God did not use any kind of material process such as is going on today, like mutation and natural selection. And only when the work of creation was finished did there begin what the many doctors call the order of providence, this natural order of things in which we are living, where all the different kinds of creatures act according to the natures that God created in the beginning, within the framework of the natural laws that God established in the beginning. Can you see that this principle, this distinction, establishes a barrier to man's pride? Because we cannot extrapolate from the material processes that are going on now all the way back to the beginning. And yet all forms of evolutionary thought, theistic and atheistic, are based on the false premise that things have always been basically the same from the beginning of creation, and that is false. What's more, the fathers of the church were very familiar with evolution. Many people today have this idea that Charles Darwin was some original genius who came up with this idea of evolution. Nothing could be further from the truth. Pre-Socratic philosophers were teaching evolutionary theories indistinguishable from Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins 500 years before the birth of our Lord. That's why St. Basil speaks about people in his time who were deceived by their inherent atheism, who thought that nothing governed or ruled the universe and that all was given up to chance. He might have been talking about Richard Dawkins' latest book. So you see, this beautiful doctrine of creation is the foundation of our faith. That Almighty God loved us so much that He created the entire world to be our home. And when we destroyed the beauty of the first created world, He came down into the misery that we made, took it all upon Himself, suffered and died on the cross, established the church, sent the Holy Ghost upon her, and invited us to cooperate with Him in the church in restoring everything back to the beauty that it had in the beginning and to something even more beautiful. Who wouldn't fall in love with a God like that? Even Viking kings would fall in love 
with that God, the true God. If you know anything about the Vikings, you know that they were basic, they were comparable to very well, well organized, very large biker gangs. Vladimir of Kiev was a Viking king, a bloodthirsty, out of control leader who knew no limits to his passions and respected nothing above himself. And yet when the true Catholic faith was proclaimed to him on the foundation of the true doctrine of creation, he was convicted and he was converted. And that ruthless barbarian became a saint, a great Catholic king, the founder of the great Catholic kingdoms of Ukraine and of Russia. But when you take away the foundation of the gospel, it loses its power. It no longer has the power to convert the unconvertible. And we see that today. Here is Monreale Cathedral, made a metropolitan cathedral at the end of the 12th century. This is where to this day you can see those beautiful icons of creation which teach the truth now as they did a thousand years ago, almost. And it's interesting that just one generation after Monreale Cathedral was made a metropolitan cathedral by the Pope, Pope Innocent III convened the Fourth Lateran Council, which promulgated the most authoritative dogmatic decree on creation in the history of the Catholic Church. And this decree was promulgated principally to combat the Albigensian heresy which was raging especially in the south of France which taught that there was not one God who created all things the spiritual and the corporeal good but rather there were two gods a spiritual principle and a material principle and they were at war because these Albigensians they looked at the horrible state of the world and they simply could not imagine that a good God had made the whole world. Very much as people look at the world today and they can't imagine that a good God created this whole world. But Pope Innocent III saw that it was absolutely necessary to reaffirm and define the constant teaching of the church that God by his own omnipotent power at once, simul, from the beginning of time, created each creature, the spiritual and the corporal, and then man. Now if you study how the greatest commentators on this council interpreted this decree for 600 years until the evolution revolution, you will find that they all understood it to mean what it plainly says, that God by fiat created all the different kinds of spiritual and corporeal creatures and then man, and that was it. Creation was finished. St. Lawrence of Brindisi is the one commentator that I will cite because of lack of time. But he's not only a doctor of the church, he is said to have known the entire Bible by heart. He knew all the biblical languages and Latin, and he was familiar with all the greatest commentators in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. And in his commentary on Genesis, which we have translated the first part of it into English for the first time, I have, I think, one copy left over here. St. Lawrence addresses a question that had been knocked around by the fathers for a long time, which was whether the angels, being very exalted creatures, might have been created long before the material universe and existed in some kind of state that hovered between time and eternity. And you know what St. Lawrence says in his commentary? St. Lawrence, doctor of the church, says no. It's not possible to hold that opinion any longer because he says the Holy Roman Church determined 
in the Fourth Lateran Council that the angels along with the creatures of the world were at once created ex nihilo from the beginning of time. Now all the fathers and doctors had held that the entire material universe was made by fiat in the beginning, but now St. Lawrence says after the Fourth Lateran Council you can't even consider that the angels might have been created long before the material universe. But Mother Church did not just give us this beautiful doctrine of creation which is the foundation of our faith. She also gave us the perennial philosophy. In Humani Generis, which we'll see, is the last authoritative teaching of the Magisterium on evolution. Pope Pius XII in Humani Generis emphasizes that the perennial philosophy, scholastic philosophy, must be maintained by the bishops and that this is necessary to safeguard the true doctrine of creation. And he highlights the importance of the metaphysical principles of sufficient reason, causality, and immutable truth. Everybody knows that blessed Pope John Paul II in Wednesday audiences and in certain addresses showed that in his opinion the evolutionary hypothesis was a sound hypothesis compatible with the Catholic faith. But very few people note that in his really authoritative teaching he makes pronouncements which if obeyed are, lead one to reject evolution as incompatible with the Catholic faith. For example, in Fides et Ratio, which is much more authoritative than any Wednesday audience or address where the Pope gave his opinion that the evolutionary hypothesis was sound, in Fides et Ratio, blessed Pope John Paul II refers back to Humani Generis and emphasizes the necessity of maintaining the philosophical tradition and terminology of the Catholic tradition and the traditional philosophy of the church. Father Chad Ripperger, who was professor of dogmatic theology at Our Lady of Guadalupe Seminary, the fraternity seminary as, as most of you know, has written a golden book on metaphysics and evolution, which was 62 years overdue because in Humani Generis in 1950, the Pope asked the bishops to bring to bear the constant philosophy and metaphysics of the church on this evolutionary hypothesis. And to my knowledge, Father Ripperger is the first theologian to have done so in a deliberate way. I know there were professors of theolo theology who dealt with this topic, but he has done an immeasurable service to the whole church by actually writing a little book that anybody can understand taking the constant metaphysical principles of the church which blessed Pope John Paul II and Pope Pius XII said must be maintained and he shows how just in light of these principles leaving aside theology and natural science we can reject theistic evolution as incompatible and to summarize a hundred pages kind of the highlight of the whole book is that the fundamental metaphysical principle that is violated by evolution is that no effect is greater than its cause. The traditional doctrine obviously respects this principle because God is the only one who can create from nothing. He can make whatever he likes. But theistic evolution in its naturalistic version requires that billions of causes produce effects that are greater than the cause. Something that has no sight produces something that does. Something that has no flight or wings produces something that does, and we go on and on. And this is a metaphysical impossibility. So the only way to save evolution is then to invoke God and say that God works a trillion miracles to make everything happen. But as Father Ripperger points out, that's absurd. Why invoke God to work a trillion miracles and deny distinct, the distinction between creation and providence 
when the traditional doctrine explains everything that we see without resorting to that kind of very complicated and unnecessary hypothesis, which, as we'll see in the, in the process, distorts the character of God. In addition, the perennial philosophy, when it's brought into the church, gives us a way to examine the natural world and arrive at the greatest possible understanding that our intellect can achieve. And this is in terms of Aristotle's four causes, the material, the efficient, the formal, and the final. So to use the Pieta as an example, and I know you're all familiar with this, if, if we were to speak of the material cause of the pieta, it would be the marble of which it is made. The efficient cause would be the chisel in the hand of Michelangelo, uh, Michelangelo, the agent that makes the thing. The formal cause is the shape, the meaningful arrangement of the material elements, which is why you can have a pieta made of plastic, marble, clay, whatever you like. And you can always recognize it as a pieta if it has that meaningful arrangement of the material elements. And then there's the final cause, which is the purpose for which the thing exists, which in this case would be to inspire devotion to our Lord and the Blessed Mother, especially in their sorrows. This perennial philosophy was so thoroughly integrated into the theological activity of the church that it even gets incorporated into dogmatic definitions. At the Council of Vienne in 1312, the Council Fathers defined that the soul is the form of the human body. Now, if this definition were understood and maintained, upheld in the same sense in which it was defined, we would not have brain death as the criterion for human death in Catholic hospitals all over the world. Why do I say that? Because if you understand that the soul being the form of the body means that it is the soul which meaningfully arranges all the organs and systems of the human body in one whole and makes it a human body, you know that you cannot reduce the human body to one of its parts. But when you accept evolution, then you accept that the human body was cobbled together piece by piece, organ by organ, over millions of years. And then what is it that distinguishes the human body from that of a chimpanzee? Our brain. But if it's our brain that distinguishes us from subhuman primates, well then if the activity in my brain drops below a certain level, you might as well call me dead. And that is why, in Catholic hospitals all over the world, a patient can have a beating heart, a pulse, normal body temperature, passing urine, exchanging gas through the lungs, but have a low EEG, be pronounced dead, and have his or her organs ripped out of the body while that patient is still alive. So this proves, I think, very well that philosophy is not a pleasant pastime for intellectuals. It is a matter of life and death. Because if the traditional philosophy of the church had been maintained as Pope Pius XII and blessed Pope John Paul II required that it be, we would not have this abomination of brain death as the criterion for human death in Catholic hospitals all over the world. You see, Mother Church gave us the most magnificent framework for doing scientific and medical research. A lawful universe of well-designed creatures, marred but not ruined by the effects of original sin, whose function but not their origins can be discovered through rational investigation. Why not their origins? because of that distinction between creation and providence. And you see, when natural scientists humble themselves and recognize that it's not their domain to figure out how everything came to be, they do much better science. That's why even after the Protestant Revolution, 
The greatest scientists in Europe continued to work within the Catholic framework. Sir William Harvey was the first natural scientist in recorded history to discover correctly the working of the circulatory system in the human body. And when he was asked, how did you do this? How did you discover something that even Leonardo da Vinci wasn't able to figure out? He said, I simply asked myself, why would the valves, why would the veins and the arteries, why would all the different parts of the system have been designed the way they are? And from that starting point, he was able to develop a hypothesis, which he then tested empirically. He confirmed his hypothesis, and he became the first natural scientist to accurately describe the working of the circulatory system in the human body because he worked within the Catholic framework for natural science. But you see, the devil has always hated the true doctrine of creation because he knows it's the foundation of our faith. In the Garden of Eden, he knew that God had revealed to Adam and to Eve through Adam the order of creation. And when he tempted her, he tempted her to doubt and disbelieve what God had revealed about the order of creation that he had established, which she had to accept on faith through the word of her husband, who was her head and who was a priest to her and to the whole human family. And so St. Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 3, one of the most incredible prophetic passages in the entire Bible, warned us that in the latter days scoffers would come and they would say, things have always been the same from the beginning of creation. Now you've been paying careful attention, so you've been able to spot the lie in that proposition. You know, if you didn't know when you walked into this room, that according to all the fathers, doctors, popes and council fathers and their authoritative teaching, things have been more or less the same from the end of creation, not from the beginning of creation. But St. Peter says the scoffers will deny that truth. And he goes on to say that they will have to deliberately ignore the fact, not the belief, the fact that in the beginning it was the Word of God that created the heavens and the earth and the seas and all they contain, not a natural process like what we see going on today. And secondly, he says, they will deny that the first created world was destroyed by a global flood in the time of Noah. And that is exactly the basis upon which the evolution revolution was launched by Hutton, Lyell, Darwin, and all their disciples. Here is the propaganda master of the evolution revolution, Sir Charles Lyell, an attorney who was also an amateur geologist. At a time when being a geologist meant, take, meant taking nice walks in the countryside, looking at the rocks and speculating about how they might have formed. Geologists had no facilities for doing real experimental research in sedimentology in Lyell's day, as they do today. And Lyell speculated that this was how sedimentary rocks formed. He thought great bodies of water came over the land, sediments settled out gradually, the waters withdrew, the sediments hardened into rock, and then this process was repeated over and over again over eons of time. And therefore, if Lyell's geology was correct, then of course if you went to a large geological sedimentary rock formation like the Grand Canyon, you would know that the sedimentary rocks at the top must be very recent compared to the ones at the bottom which must have formed eons ago. And then if that's true, then it follows that the fossils in these sedimentary rocks tell the story of life developing over eons of time, from the simpler to the more complex, from the fish to the amphibian to the reptile to the bird and the mammal and finally to man. And that of course gives us Darwinian evolution, biological evolution. Darwin says at the beginning of Origin of Species, if you do not accept Lyell's work on geology, you might as well close my book. Because you see, 
Darwinian biological evolution is based 100% on Lyellian speculation. And so we get the tree of life, which adorns biology textbooks in Catholic schools and universities all over the world in the 21st century. And of course we get human evolution. But Almighty God loves us so much that He sent the Mother of God on the eve of the publication of Darwin's Origin of Species to give the lie to this diabolical hypothesis of human evolution. And she did it with just a few words. When Saint Bernadette asked her, who are you? She said, I am the Immaculate Conception. It was Saint Maximilian Kolbe who meditated on these words over and over and over again. What does this mean? I am the Immaculate Conception. And after a long time, he came to the realization that these words reaffirmed the traditional teaching of the Church on creation. Because St. Maximilian realized Adam was not a conception, he was a special creation. Eve was not a conception, she was a special creation. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the second person of the Blessed Trinity. He didn't begin to exist in the womb of the Blessed Virgin. So St. Maximilian concluded, it's true. The Blessed Virgin Mary is the unique, immaculate conception. But you see, if theistic evolution is true, which is what is being taught to most Catholic young people in schools, Catholic schools and universities and CCD programs all over the world, then Adam was conceived in the womb of a beast. Eve was conceived in the womb of a beast. And God either put the soul into the conception, or after they were born at some point, He put the soul in and they suddenly, as many theologians like to say today, fell up into consciousness. But, Saint Maximilian realized what all of us should realize if we reflect for even a moment, that even theistic evolutionists admit that Adam and Eve, when they were created, did not have any sin and therefore they would be immaculate conceptions. And then the Blessed Mother, when she answered Saint Bernadette, would have had to say, I am the immaculate conception number three. But she didn't say that. Because as Saint Maximilian realized, and as we should all realize, Adam and Eve were, in the words of Pope Pelagius I, in a profession of faith. which the King of the Franks had to profess and believe in order to be accepted as a Catholic, he said, he had to profess, Adam and Eve were not born of parents, but were created, Adam from the dust of the earth, and Eve from Adam's side. The tragedy is not that the secular elite embraced Darwinian and Lyellian speculation. The real tragedy is that leading Catholic intellectuals started leaping on the evolutionary bandwagon as early as the end of the 19th century. Father Vigarou was one of the leading scripture scholars in the world, Catholic scripture scholars. And yet in 1882 he made this incredible statement, geology has established that creation was not simultaneous. It was reserved to our time to discover clearly the true meaning of the cosmogonic days. That means the days of Genesis 1. Now how could geology establish anything when it had no facilities for doing real experimental research in the field? It couldn't. And how could Father Vigarou say, in effect, the fathers, the doctors, the popes, the council fathers, they were all idiots. But thanks to Lyle and Darwin, we finally got it right. What arrogance. Thanks be to God, St. Pius X was not one of those theologians that hopped on the Darwinian Lyellian bandwagon. 
He saw that these ideas were not only false, they were dangerous. And he condemned with the full weight of his office in 1907 in Lamentabili the proposition that the progress of the sciences, meaning here the natural sciences, demands that the concept of Christian doctrine about creation be recast or changed. And I defy anyone to show us how Lyellian geology and Darwinian biology can be combined with the Catholic faith without changing or recasting the traditional doctrine of creation. It cannot be done. So the good news is, Almighty God has already drawn a line in the sand. And because of lamentabili, we can be certain that the magisterium of the Catholic Church will never teach theistic evolution as something that Catholics should believe. Because God will never contradict himself. As we mentioned earlier, the last authoritative teaching of the Magisterium was Humani Generis of Pope Pius XII in 1950. If you actually read this encyclical from beginning to end, you will discover that it is very negative about the evolutionary hypothesis. Nowhere in this encyclical does Pope Pius XII permit anyone in the church to teach evolution. The only permission that he gives in paragraph 36 is for Catholic scholars to examine the evidence for and against the evolutionary hypothesis. The tragedy is the Pope was not obeyed. Since 1950 there have probably been thousands of conferences in Catholic universities and research centers making the case for theistic evolution. But I can literally count on one hand the number of conferences that have been held at Catholic universities and research centers to give Catholic scholars the opportunity to make the overwhelming case against the evolutionary hypothesis. And I have the proceedings of two of them on that table <laughs> because they've all been held in the last five years. Evolution thrives on censorship and intimidation. And it's only because Pope Pius XII has still not been obeyed and there has not been an open and honest debate between the defenders of special creation, the traditional teaching, and the promoters of theistic evolution that theistic evolution remains the consensus view in Catholic academia. And Pope Benedict XVI knew and admitted in writing that that fair and open and honest debate has never taken place. He says so right in Truth and Tolerance, published in English the year before he was elected to succeed Blessed Pope John Paul II. And we believe that when that fair, open and honest debate takes place, evolution is finished. And we ask you to pray with us that that fair, open, and honest debate will take place as soon as possible for the glory of God and for the good of souls. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. We'll take a break. I hope it's a very short one because we have the second part of this presentation still to do, which is really the most important part. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to Thee. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. I want to very briefly just take one little area of natural science and show you the immense harm that the acceptance of the evolutionary hypothesis has done to this one area of natural science. In our standard seminar we can go into different areas of natural science and develop the argument systematically, but this will, I think, at least give you something to think about. 
We know that in our Catholic schools and universities all over the world we have this tree of life and uh, students are told either that a la Ken Miller at Brown University this all happened naturalistically, God just started things going maybe with the Big Bang, maybe with the first cell and then everything just developed from that point into all the different kinds of creatures or there are they're, they're the Théard de Chardin uh, school that holds that God has been working through this process of death, deformity, disease, mutation, natural selection to produce all of these different kinds of creatures. But both of them agree that there was this tree of life. Now, it's interesting that ever since Darwin, embryology has been cited again and again and again as a striking proof, if not the most striking proof, for the truth of the evolutionary hypothesis. And uh, Ernst Haeckel was a German anatomist and Darwin disciple who wanted to make ordinary people like us true believers and so he thought he would help us along by exaggerating the similarities between the human embryo and the embryos of chickens, pigs, turtles, salamanders and fish at the same stage of development. Now he was exposed as a fraud by his own peers but that didn't stop his drawings very slightly changed entering into textbooks in Catholic schools and universities all over the world where they comfortably reside in the 21st century. Now Father Zahm was one of the leading lights at Notre Dame University a hundred years ago. He was a theologian and a natural scientist. He was a personal friend of Teddy Roosevelt and he wanted to get Notre Dame on the map with Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Princeton and Yale. And He said the way we're going to do it is we're going to show that we are cutting edge we are not stuck back in the Middle Ages, we're embracing the natural sciences and of course that meant embracing evolution. So Father Zahm started to write books showing how evolution and the Catholic faith went hand in hand and in his books he argued that one of the most striking proofs for the truth of the evolutionary hypothesis was embryology. He said look at the human embryo how it goes through these stages which are almost identical to those of the fish, the amphibian, the reptile and so on and doesn't this prove that evolution is true? Well there is a direct line from that fateful time at the beginning of the 20th century when Notre Dame embraced theistic evolution to that day at the beginning of the 21st century when Barack Obama the most pro-abortion political leader in the world walked on stage at Notre Dame and received an honorary degree while the, the Catholics and other pro-lifers were being shackled and taken off to the county jail, not even allowed to peacefully protest this abomination. Because you see, without the denigration of the unborn from the moment of conception through theistic evolution, the way would never have been, would, would never have been paved for Barack Obama to receive his honorary degree as the most pro-abortion political leader in the world at the beginning of the 21st century. Now Sir Gillian Huxley was the foremost apologist for evolution in the middle of the 20th century. My father looked up to him immensely. One of the last books my father acquired before he died was The Phenomenon of Man by Teilhard de Chardin with a foreword by Sir Gillian Huxley. And Sir Julian laid it on the line as the foremost scientific apologist for evolution. He said, embryology gives the most striking proof of evolution. So when I was going to school at supposedly the best schools in the world, this is what we were given. But you see eventually, just like the Wellhausen hypothesis, Every hypothesis that contradicts the traditional teaching of the church will eventually collide with reality and be blown to smithereens. On the top row here you have Heckel's forgeries, exaggerating grossly the similarities between the human embryo and the embryos of the other kinds of creatures. On the bottom row you have actual photographs of the human embryo and the other embryos at the same stage of development. Published in Scientific American by Michael Richardson in the mid 90's. Do you see that the actual photographs, the real science, completely contradicts 
all the predictions of all the leading evolutionists from Darwin to today. Generation after generation has been brainwashed into thinking that the human embryo recapitulates its evolutionary history, and yet reality shows, screams, that not only is the human embryo distinct from all the other embryos right from the start, notice that the other kinds of creatures have a very distinct embryonic development from the beginning. That is 100% consistent with the traditional teaching of the church, that God by fiat created the different kinds of creatures, not transforming one into another. And it is completely contradictory to the predictions of the evolutionists. And yet, in the 21st century, the same lies are being foisted on Catholic young people in Catholic schools and universities all over the world. And I am ashamed to tell you that this is a page out of a biology textbook published in 2002 and co-authored by a member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. Does it look as if Dr. Raven updated his textbook in light of information that was available almost a decade before this book was published? Or does it look like he's recycling the same Heckelian lies? And notice the, the caption. The caption that tells Catholic young people that all vertebrates, including us, have gill slits in the wombs of our mothers. what are called gill slits, have absolutely nothing to do with respiration. Even honest evolutionists admit that now. They develop into the pharyngeal arches in different parts of the facial anatomy. So why are we telling Catholic young people that human embryos have gill slits in their mother's womb? Is it any surprise that a Catholic young lady in this country is almost as likely to have an abortion as an unbeliever? No, it's not a surprise. After all, her biology teacher in her Catholic school and university told her that embryos have gill slits. And then she went to her religion class and her professor or her CCD teacher told her, evolution is a fact and it's perfectly compatible with the Catholic faith. Father Rahner was arguably the most influential theologian, Catholic theologian of the 20th century. His books are still being used in seminaries all over the world. But Father Rahner embraced, just as Father Zahm had done two generations before him, he accepted uncritically the claims of the Sir Julian Huxleys of this world and actually wrote that there are biological developments in the womb of a human mother which are pre-human. And so of course, in 1970 when he wrote these words, the people who wanted to legalize abortifacient contraception and abortion in the first trimester, they could say, look, even your smartest theologians are smart enough to recognize that evolution is a fact. Are you people so stupid? as to keep trying to outlaw birth control and abortion in the first trimester when the embryo is only in the fish stage or the amphibian stage. And so we got the contraceptive holocaust. These figures are from the 1990s, but the same thing is going on today. It's estimated that 10 times as many innocent children are killed by abortifacient contraception as by surgical abortion. And I'm sure you know that it's not only the birth control pill that kills babies. Most forms of contraception are abortifacient. And why is this accepted so widely? It is largely because of the acceptance of evolutionary pseudoscience, which has denigrated, even in the minds of most Catholics, the sacred dignity of the unborn child from the moment of conception. You would think that the evolutionists would require a little bit of humility 
in pushing embryology as a proof of evolution after the Michael Richardson photographs came out. But I'm going to prove to you that you can take the smartest person in the world and if he embraces a false philosophy, he can be blind to things that a five-year-old child would be able to see. Jerry Coyne is one of the leading evolutionary biologists in the world. He's at Harvard University, arguably the most prestigious research university on earth in the eyes of the world. And in a recent book, 2009, Why Evolution is True, Dr. Coyne argues still that embryological evidence is still strong evidence for the truth of the evolutionary hypothesis. Why? Because he says unborn babies have a transitory coat of hair. And I want you to pay careful attention to Dr. Coyne's reasoning now. There's no need, he says, for a human embryo to have a transitory coat of hair which is called lanugo. It's a cozy 98.6 degrees in there. It must be. It can only be explained as a remnant of our primate ancestry. Don't you see? It must be a holdover from that earlier stage of evolution when we had the kind of hair that chimpanzees and baboons have. Do you see that faith in the evolutionary hypothesis is anti-science? Do you think for a moment that Leonardo da Vinci or Harvey or Maxwell or Faraday, if they looked at Lanugo, would have said, there's no need for it, it must be a holdover from an earlier stage of evolution? No real natural scientist and no natural scientist working within the Catholic framework of the Catholic doctrine of creation would ever make such an absurd statement. If you have ever had the privilege of holding or beholding a beautiful brand new baby, you know that little babies come into the world normally covered with this stuff that is called vernix cassiosa or cheesy varnish. This cheesy varnish protects the soft skin of the unborn child from the amniotic fluid in the mother's womb. But you see, there's an engineering problem. How to keep the vernix cassiosa on the baby's very smooth skin? Anyone want to suggest a solution? The lanugo. And so today, in an up-to-date course in human embryology, students will be taught the vernix cassiosa is a combination of sebaceous gland secretions and dead epidermal cells, and the lanugo hair helps retain it on the outer skin surface. So what we should have been doing with our students as we contemplated the lanugo is saying, how great God is. Glory to God. How great our God is. But instead, in Catholic schools and universities all over the world, Catholic students are saying, gosh, how many useless things are there that are just holdovers from some earlier stage of evolution? St. Maximilian Kolbe was one of the few Catholic intellectuals who saw through all the smoke and mirrors and saw that the emperor of evolution was not wearing any clothes. In the 20s and 30s, St. Maximilian Kolbe was writing articles in his publications exposing the baseless nature of the evolutionary hypothesis. And this is because St. Maximilian was not only a genius in theology and philosophy, he was also a genius in the natural sciences. His professors believed that if he had pursued a career in the natural sciences, he would have achieved greatness on the order of Leonardo da Vinci and Maxwell, Faraday, the greatest scientists who ever lived. 
And that is why St. Maximilian was able to write in 1932, at the very time that my father was being robbed of his faith, because there was no one who was able to stand up and say, there's another side to this story. This theory not only does not agree with the results of today's experimental science, which is in constant progress, but in reality it contradicts these findings, as has been carefully documented. And how fitting that St. Maximilian went up as a holocaust in Auschwitz, which was an applied experiment in evolutionary theory where the intellectual elite of Germany who followed Hitler to the hilt because they were all evolutionists believed that they were just doing evolution in the lab when they performed barbaric experiments on less evolved humans for the benefit of the stronger and more highly evolved. What difference does it make? That's the question that we need to end with. Because so many people say, well, what difference did it really make? What difference does it make whether I believe that God by fiat created a perfectly harmonious world for our first parents? Or if he used hundreds of millions of years of death, deformity and disease, mutation and natural selection to evolve the bodies of the first human beings? What difference does it make as long as I believe that God did it? Well, St. Thomas gave us the answer to that question a long time ago. In the Summa Contra Gentiles, St. Thomas says, the opinion of those who say, with regard to the truth of the faith, that it is a matter of complete indifference what one thinks about creation, provided one has a true interpretation of God, is notoriously false. And that's very strong language for the angelic doctor. Because, he says, an error about creation is reflected in a false opinion about God. He's saying, if you don't understand creation correctly, you don't understand God correctly. Because God's character is reflected in the way he created the world. And if you don't understand it correctly, you don't understand the character of God. And that's why he goes on to quote the psalmist. Because they have not understood the works of the Lord and the operations of his hands, thou shalt destroy them and shalt not build them up. When we deny God's revelation of what he did in the beginning, we destroy the very foundations under us. And that's why St. Paul in the letter to the Romans chapter 1 says, The wrath of God is poured out upon those who suppress the truth about creation. He says God's invisible qualities are clearly seen in the things that he has made, and no one has any excuse for not believing in them. Everyone knows in his gut when he looks at the fantail of a peacock that he is looking at a work of art of a supreme genius. He is not looking at the result of a long product of mutation and natural selection. Darwin believed that this beautiful fantail had to have come into existence through the struggle for existence. He wrote in a letter to Asa Gray, every time I see peacock feathers I feel sick. Because it was even hard for him to believe that this beauty was just the result of such a banal cause as the struggle for existence. That the peacock, in order to attract more peahens, somehow magically evolved some more attractive plumage. And then because the peahens flocked to those peacocks who had more attractive plumage, it just kept on getting more and more attractive until we ended up with this. Well, somewhere along the line, some natural scientists decided that they would set their evolutionary mythology aside and do some real science. And they actually observed some peacocks and peahens in action. And do you know what they found out? Peahens could care less about peacock feathers. 
it doesn't interest them in the least. What peahens are attracted to is the voice of the peacock. So there goes another evolutionary myth out the window. It finally collided with reality and got blown to smithereens. But you won't know that if you go to a typical Catholic school or university. No, the reason why we have this beautiful fan tale is because of God's love for you. And that is why he filled this world with beautiful things. Perfectly unnecessary, gratuitous beauty for your delight so that you could look at this and give glory to God and, and thank Him for His love and His fatherly care. But as St. Paul said, we have exchanged the truth for a lie. How could God have made it any plainer? Wisdom chapter 1. God made not death, neither hath he pleasure in the destruction of the living, for he created all things that they might be. Any father or doctor of the church who had been told that God used the destruction of lower creatures to produce the first human body would have rent his garments. Darwin tells us it's death that brings forth human life. Or if you like Carl Sagan, only through an immense number of deaths of slightly maladapted organisms are you and I, brains and all, here today. And all the theistic evolutionist does is say that through an immense number of deaths of slightly maladapted organisms, the god of Terre de Chardin produced the first human body and put a soul into it. And this is now the consensus view in Catholic academia. This is from a letter from Sister Joan Acker to the publisher, the editor of America Magazine. She was incensed that the 1994 Catechism didn't even mention the word evolution. How could the editors be so stupid as not to mention the central concept of all modern thought? And she goes on to say, science reinforces theology in recognizing that disease and death have always been part of God's plan for earthly becoming. Sister Joan must have crowds flocking into the Catholic Church to worship that God who always had death and disease as part of his special plan for us. No, God made not death and neither hath he pleasure in the destruction of the living. If I had time, we could talk for one whole hour about how our whole society and our families could be renewed if we just believed and taught this one part of the traditional Catholic doctrine of creation, the creation of Eve from Adam's side. We don't have time. Suffice it to say that this is the truth which if we believed it and meditated on it, would remind us that God created man first because he created Adam to be the head of his wife and family. And he created Eve from Adam's side to be the heart of the human family. So that they would be equal in dignity but with different roles. And God revealed to Adam alone the commandment not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because he was the spiritual head. And the fall would not have taken place if when Eve disobeyed, Adam had corrected her. And isn't this the taboo doctrine in our society today, even within the Catholic community? We must not speak of man having any special role of leadership. We must not speak of the father and husband of being the spiritual head of his family. And we forget what this holy icon still teaches and will teach until the end of the world that God created for us a perfectly harmonious world that perfectly reflected his wisdom, his beauty, and his goodness. 
A couple of years ago, Pope Benedict XVI beatified Sister Elena Aiello, a holy religious, dedicated to the poor, but also a great mystic and a victim soul. Around 1960, the Mother of God told Blessed Sister Elena Aiello, the world is in a worse state than at, than at the time of the deluge. To understand how bad that is, let's go to Genesis 6, 5, where Moses tells us that before the flood, God saw that the wickedness of men was great on the earth and that all the thought of their heart was bent upon evil at all times. And the mother of God tells us that we are in a worse state today than they were then. And she didn't only tell us once. October 13, 1973, the anniversary of the miracle of the sun at Fatima, the year of Roe versus Wade, from a statue that wept human tears 101 times and wept tears of blood. The mother of God told Sister Agnes Asagawa, if mankind does not repent, the Heavenly Father will inflict a punishment worse than the deluge, such as one will never have seen before. And the local ordinary studied this message for 11 years. And he wrote a pastoral letter saying that this message was true. And he went to Rome and he showed it to then Cardinal Ratzinger and asked him if he should publish it. And Cardinal Ratzinger told him, yes, you should. This is just a continuation of the message of Fatima. So what is it? Does it not follow that there must be some false way of thinking that has entered into the very atmosphere that we breathe so that even good and holy people against their will imbibe it and so that it corrupts our way of thinking and our attitudes? I submit that evolution fits the bill. And if we had time, I could elaborate on that how it makes us, against our will, have contempt for the past, contempt for tradition, contempt for social hierarchy, contempt for hierarchy within the family, contempt for the Lord's Day, contempt for the Word of God. St. Nicholas von Flew, patron saint of Switzerland, survived for many years on the Blessed Sacrament alone. In the 15th century, was shown the Protestant Revolution. He predicted exactly where in Switzerland it would take place. And then he looked farther into the future and he saw these times. An unhappy time is coming, he said, of revolt. Oh, my children, do not let yourselves be led astray by innovations. Rally and hold fast. Stay on the same road, the same footpaths as your pious fathers trod. Preserve and maintain what they have taught you. It will be enough if you resist the attacks, the tempests, the hurricanes that will arise with such violence. The church will be punished because the majority of her members, high and low, will become so perverted. The church will sink deeper and deeper until she will at last seem to be extinguished and the succession of Peter and the apostles to have expired. Will seem, not that it will be, but after this she will be victoriously exalted in the sight of all doubters. As the Blessed Mother said, in the end my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me, and a period of peace will be granted to the world after Russia is converted. And in that era of peace, Catholics will look back upon this time and they will be amazed that we could ever have entertained such a perverse hypothesis as theistic evolution. So I say that the time has come for us to choose this day whom we are going to serve. Who are we going to present to our children and children as the true God? Will it be the God of creation who spoke the heavens and the earth and the seas and all they contain into existence, a perfectly harmonious creation, who created Adam, body and soul, in the perfect image and likeness of Christ, making him a son of God, as St. Luke says, who created Eve from Adam's side as a foreshadowing of the birth of Christ from the wounded side of Christ, and who placed them as the king and queen over the whole universe, 
a universe which was marred only by their sin, which brought human death and deformity and disease into an immaculate world? Or will we continue to allow our children and our grandchildren to be indoctrinated into what I have to call the demonic god, little g, of evolution, who uses material processes over hundreds of millions of years to evolve the first cell and then all the different kinds of creatures. And when he finally gets around to conceiving the body of Adam in the womb of a subhuman primate or has him, has him born from a subhuman primate and puts the soul in at some later stage, he plops him down with Eve in a world that he himself, the god little g of evolution, has filled with death, deformity, and disease. Well, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, the Lord of creation. For thou hast formed me and hast laid thy hand upon me. Thou hast protected me from my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for thou art fearfully magnified. Wonderful are thy works. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.